Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Welcome in, Rob Black Show. Rob Black and your money. Show dedicated to continued retirement. Show dedicated to helping you cut down mistakes on investing in insurance, saving and earning, buying cars. Whatever I can do to help is the goal. My background is growth tech stocks. Um, but I've amassed enough wealth that I've done it for enough time that I feel comfortable telling you some of the things I've done right and some of the things I've done wrong. Anything you want me to bring up, drop me an email, rob at robblackshow.com. It's rob at robblackshow.com. Best Buy earnings beat expectations. Wasn't a great quarter. Wasn't a horrible quarter. They basically said next year, we're going to see growth in electronics. That disruption in tech during COVID and consumers stockpiling with new computers and laptops during COVID, that cycle is starting to get to replacement cycles or replacement times. Best Buy also sounded some alarms on credit cards. I think it's worthy of bringing up more on that, though, when time is right. Um, let's get to some of the issues that we have to talk about today. I always like to start today with a little bit of let's go back to yesterday. The markets saw growth as August is on the 29th today. So what do we have today, tomorrow? Thursday, and then Friday is a new day, new month, and a new jobs report. So we are going to end August down somewhere in the S&P 500 between 2, roughly 2%, and the NASDAQ somewhere between 3 to 4%. But that's okay. It was a glorious, glorious first seven months of the year. In the eighth month, not so good. Interesting, right? Hawaiian Electric came out on the swing or the offensive. They said, yeah, there was a downed power line, but it didn't cause the big fire. Our, our fire was put out by the fire department pretty quickly. That stock was up 44% yesterday on that news. Would I buy it? No. I refer to these as Civil War stocks where everyone, not everyone, but there's one side that wants it to turn into pg e and go bankrupt. And there's another side that kind of is living in denial that that could happen. I don't like it. Let's see, where else do we have to go as far as top headlines go? Maybe the Trump headlines. And, and again, I'm not being political. 2020, 20, 2024. It's going to be a show. And that's going to bleed into Wall Street at times. The judge overseeing the federal criminal case of former President Donald Trump and his alleged efforts to overturn his 2020 election selected March 4th, one day before Super Tuesday, when states hold primary votes, as the day his trial should begin. Trump wanted to push it to 2026. Not going to happen. Trump vowed to appeal and called the judge biased into truth social post after the hearing. At a separate hearing in Georgia, a state law conspiracy case against Trump, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows testified he hopes of getting the claims against him moved from state to federal court. Uh, I don't know. That's one area that I, I don't know. <clears throat> All I'm telling you is that 2024 is setting up to be, and maybe every political year after this, uh, it's just setting up to be a, he stole it. He didn't steal it. Uh, we won. You didn't win. He's ruining America. You're ruining America. It, it's not going to be a fun political season, I think, ever again. And it, it not, maybe they weren't that fun in the first place, right? Yeah, so we got news that Google Flights upgraded its cheap airfare tractor. 
Buckley and your fanny pack, ladies and gentlemen. Your captain is saying we're going to be flying at 34,000 feet. Google announced yesterday that the beginning of October is projected to be the best time to book a domestic Thanksgiving or mid-December flight. Mark it on your calendars. <clears throat> Honey, buy plane tickets at the beginning of October. <clears throat> Put in a reminder at the end of September. Cheapest time to book before its recent upgrade. Google Flights already labeled listed ticket prices low, typical, or high compared to post averages. Some new listing features a date range for when flights will be the least. They have a price guarantee. A colorful badge appearing next to some flights mean you'll be reimbursed via Google Pay if the ticket price drops after you hit purchase. That's pretty good. You get the opt-in notifications alert that uh, tells you when the price drops for specific dates or for any time in the next three to six months. These updates are taking aim at Kayak and Hopper, which offer similar features but charge extra for their versions of price guarantees. I like Google. I think that stock's getting ready to move. My son just got uh, the NFL package. I think it's called the NFL package. It could be called game day or something. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and I think YouTube will um, do everything that they can when you're on their site to show you, hey, you can buy this for two, $300 a year. It's an expensive product. A lot of celebrities are running back to Cameo now that the Hollywood actor strike is into its second big month. 2,400 performers have joined or rejoined the site. So for $1,500, you can get Fran Drescher in her nasally voice to say, Happy birthday, Robert. Thank you, but no thank you. I could find other ways to lose money. OpenAI launched ChatGPT Enterprise, the business version of its popular chatbot. As it looks to boost revenue from the product, 3M has agreed to pay $6 billion to settle 250,000 lawsuits from veterans claiming the company's earplugs were faulty. Elton John. He spent a night in the hospital after he fell at his French villa. We're all getting older, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I saw this story last night. And I instantly thought long-term care. He doesn't need it. He's got the money to uh, pay for having a nurse at his home or having uh, someone help him. I never understand these stories because they just, they perplex me a little bit. American Airlines was hit with a $4.1 million fine for delays that left passengers stranded on the tarmac. It's the largest fine ever issued by the Department of Transportation. If I'm American Airlines, I'm telling my pilots and my crew, whatever you do, don't get stuck out there. And if that means something different, like it just, I, I, it just seems like we're going to lose maybe fewer flights. I don't know. Just, it feels like that kind of fine ends up coming back to haunt me personally. And you're saying that's irrelevant, irrational. Best Buy reported better than expected second quarter earnings and said it expects 2024 comp sales to decline four to five percent versus its prior guidance of three to six percent. Biden administration named its first 10 drugs that are going to be subject to Medicare price negotiations. Citigroup upgraded AT&T and Verizon to buy from neutral, noting that the wireless business is showing signs of stabilizing. Bloomberg is reporting that China's biggest banks are likely to cut rates on deposits and existing mortgages in a bid to stimulate growth. China's a problem right now. Sometimes I'll watch these afternoon financial shows and they're like, uh, you should buy into China. I'm like, nope. Don't trust the information coming out of China's spin control. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Don't want to work forever? Check out the retirement planning guide on robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. Thanks for being a part of the show. Kind of a big story today, for sure. The Biden administration has <laughs> unveiled its first 10 drugs subject to Medicare. Price negotiations. The announcement kicks off a controversial process under the Inflation Reduction Act that aims to make cost of medications more affordable for older Americans. You'll often hear times of how Merck, Pfizer, Johnson Johnson, Bristol Myers Squibb, 
they charge different prices for their drugs in different parts of the world. And the most affluent part of the world, the United States, gets the highest prices. And they tend to say, the big drug companies, we got to make our profits somewhere if we're going to help people all around the world. The announcement kicks off a controversial process under the Inflation Reduction Act that aims to make costly medications more affordable. Eliquis is made by Bristol-Myers Squibb. It's used to prevent blood clotting to reduce the risk of stroke. Um, I don't know that many old people, and I'm getting there myself, but I know my mom took Eliquis. Jardiant's made by Boehringer Ingelheim. It's used to lower blood sugar for people with type 2 diabetes. Exalto, made by Johnson Johnson, is used to prevent blood clotting. Genuvia, made by Merck, is used to lower blood sugar for people with type 2 diabetes. Farxia, I think that's how I say it. Farxia, by AstraZeneca, is used for type 2 diabetes. Entresto, made by Novartis, is used to treat certain types of heart failure. Enbrel, by Amgen, is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. You get the idea. A lot of these drugs are tied towards people being overweight. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the weight uh, loss drugs like Wagovi, play into the future of healthcare in the United States. I've got a brother-in-law who is easily lost. He looks scary how much weight he's lost. Bony is, is the right way of saying it, but it's less heart risk. So the Medicare negotiations are the centerpiece of Biden administration's efforts to rein in the rising cost of medications in the United States. Some Democrats in Congress and consumer advocates have long pushed for the change as many seniors around the country struggle to afford care. And yeah, we have all heard stories about a relative or an in-law who is struggling to figure out, do I eat food or do I take medicine? And then they do the thing that's even worse and they start self-medicating like one every other day kind of situation. So that's a big story today. Real big story in my opinion. Um, there's some economic data that we're going to be talking about today. Consumer confidence, it's slumped to a reading of 106 in August from a downwardly revised 114 in July. In the same period a year ago, it was at 103. The key takeaway here is the present situation index dropped. The expectation index for the future dropped. It is hitting a level right now that is historically signaling a recession within the next year. Year ahead, inflation expectations increased from 5.7% to 5.8%. So that's what you need to know about consumer confidence today. The job openings report, 8.8 .8 million. 8.82 million prior was revised to 9.1. So the number of job openings are coming down, which is considered positive for the stock market. If you have too many job openings, you have too much of the economy that's not working. There's some basic logic there. Job openings were not hitting on all cylinders. And to hit on all cylinders, we have a very positive thing. Now, again, Immigration brings a lot of controversy when you talk about it in the United States. We've all heard the story of an illegal immigrant breaking his leg, going to the hospital, getting free uh, care, doctors refusing, doctors not refusing. We've all heard about the illegal immigrant who kills someone. We've all heard it. But in my world of business and jobs, those job openings are get filled by sometimes illegal immigrants and, and immigrants. There are almost 4 million more open roles than job seekers in the United States. Here's why some economists think the immigration and labor crisis are related. The U.S. has more than 9 million open roles in June. That number went down today, I just told you, to 8.8 .8 million. So it went down, but it didn't go down by all. Well, I guess it depends on how you look at it, right? There's 5.8 million unemployed workers in the United States. Some economists say all those roles are unlikely to be filled by people currently living in the United States, and some people don't really want to go back to work. 
or they don't want to leave the area that they live in to go find work elsewhere. Some people are just unqualified to work. In 1986, Congress banned people working without authorization in the United States. They made it impossible to hire someone who was in the U.S. illegally or without employment authorization. 51% of Americans, and I love that number because it's split right down the middle of the net, 51% of Americans surveyed by the Cato Institute worry immigration could reduce the number of jobs available. The number of job openings remain at historic levels. So we are not running a full economy. And keep in mind, the more economy we run, the more taxes we open for us to spend. We could blunt some of the effects of fertility decline and population aging by having an immigration policy that may be a bit more focused, not necessarily on just accepting anybody, but for bringing in people to fill in skill gaps. It is a controversial topic, and I have to be very careful on how far I talk because I don't want to upset anyone because we're all so easily offended. And we all have opinions that were influenced when we were younger. And some people don't want to say, you know, Rob's kind of right. If we can match immigration with job openings, that may be a good thing. One of the headlines that grabs attention this morning is tied towards lithium. Lithium shortage by 2025, which look at the calendar, it's coming up. A worldwide shortage of lithium could be on its way as demand for the metal ramps up. Global lithium supply is expected to enter a deficit relative to demand by 2025. China is the world's third largest producer of lithium. The world produced 540,000 metric tons of lithium in 2021. And by 2030, the World Economic Forum projects that global demand will reach over 3 million metric tons. So lithium mining is still a thing. Um... When you have a supply shortage and you have demand, oh boy, prices go higher. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. What's the best way to choose a financial advisor? Download our guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. This is usually my favorite sector because I typically go into how to make money. Now, I know I've hinted at a worldwide lithium shortage in the next two years should equal good things for lithium mining companies. But what have I not hinted at today? Where is there some opportunity? Um, NVIDIA is now trading at 40 times next year's earnings. And I own shares of NVIDIA. And it is a very controversial stock that's priced for perfection. A lot of people are quite angry that the company has announced that they're going to buy back more shares, $25 billion of shares, because they're projected to make about $36 billion in cash flow next year. Some people would say, why didn't you open more capacity? Why don't you have Asia make you more semiconductors? If there's such demand, why not go there? Their revenue jump was the most incredible revenue jump I've ever seen year over year for two quarters in a row for an established trillion dollar company um and ultimately they're basically going to be growing at a hundred percent earnings for the next two quarters provided things fall into place as they should sometimes they don't but nvidia is up 15 today i thought i'd talk a little bit on why we should talk about this So January, February, March, April, May, June, July, stock market was roaring. Especially around March, it started taking off as NVIDIA reported a great quarter uh, from March and said that this AI thing's all that in a bucket of chicken. Microsoft stock went up, NVIDIA stock went up. I own both sets of shares. August was a month where we go, you know what? Let's pause and reflect because we're getting a little bit of distraction. We're seeing the odds of recession creep higher. Today's consumer confidence numbers shows us that. We're seeing uh, consumer spending, which comes out tomorrow. 
Um, and that's a hard data point that I'm going to be taking a look at to see how much we're spending on a year over year basis when you cut out inflation. Is it demand driven or is it just inflation padded? But a lot of people are saying, you know, well, NVIDIA had its run. Now, what do I do? Well, you wait for a pullback like you're currently getting. I think tech stocks will start rallying again soon as the AI tidal wave that NVIDIA is saying when they show us their growth on a year over year basis. Companies are sucking up GPUs and there's even uh, research notes out on companies that are GPU rich and companies that are GPU poor. Companies that can afford this big spending and companies that do not afford the big spending. NVIDIA's second quarter earnings signal there will be a massive rise in investment in the sector over the next 12 to 18 months. Dan Ives out of Wedbrush said this morning in a research note, our thoughts, despite a stubborn tenure in the Fed, tech goes higher. The NVIDIA guidance speaks to a tidal wave of AI-driven spending on the horizon for the tech sector over the coming years. As companies grab these GPUs, they're going to do something with them, make applications, start companies, create efficiencies, um, kind of change the world. The healthcare world is, is ripe for AI change. Ives predicted slowdown this month will prove to be a temporary blip rather than a longer term trend and pointed to the profit guidance numbers published by NVIDIA as evidence of the upcoming spending spree. Companies don't spend money unless they're going to do something with it. And he's saying it's not a trajectory of 15 percent. He's saying it's a rocket ship like trajectory. He says we're seeing an improvement in spending for software chips and digital media. I like Dan Ives. He's one of those people, my Google alerts that uh, he's made me more money than not. By building his ideas into my thesis. On investing. I think a smart guy and he's just saying, remember. Yes, the valuation is high. Yes, this Nasdaq has come a long way fast. But when you're spending that kind of money, you're rolling out product later. I think that's worthy of repeating maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. The other really thoughtful piece of research that came out this morning was from Mohammed El Arian, who I like a lot, except for when he's on financial media. He talks about the Jets. And it's like the reporter is just bored and says, So what do they got the Jets this season? He goes, and he starts gushing about Aaron Rodgers or he gushing about like last season or the season before. But anyway, I'm digressing. El Arian is an economist. And I want to say he's my favorite. But when he talks, I listen. And he brought up a really interesting point that I think we all know, but maybe we don't say it out loud. He said the Federal Reserve and their aggressive interest rate hiking cycle over the past year could be to blame for the housing market being broken. Now I have a neighbor that she's like almost 100, it feels like. And she put her house up for sale and got a cash offer for over $3 million within a week. That's not the housing market. That's an owl ear. Going back to Mohammed Al Arian, he's saying there's a real issue as to whether we've broken the housing market. The average rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage notched a fresh 23-year high at 7.48%. High rates have frozen the housing market over the past year by crimping both supply and demand. That's where it's broken, the supply and the demand. And we know this, but we he said it more eloquently than I or you. Many prospective buyers are priced out of the market due to higher cost of borrowing. Got it. Mortgage rates are at 23-year highs at 7.4%. But on the other hand, a lot of existing homers are discouraged from putting their properties up for sale, as many are looking to cling on to the low interest rates, which they financed their homes years ago. Again, that sums me up beautifully. Another reason I never prepay a mortgage. By not prepaying a mortgage, I'm now able to have that cash that would have been prepaid on a 2.5% 30-year mortgage 
sitting in a bank account earning five and a half percent. I'm winning this way. But on top of it, if I sell my current home and say, let's, I'm eventually going to leave financial media, right? And when I do, I'll, and my kids are in college, I'll probably downsize. Um, don't need the pool anymore if the kids aren't in it. Don't need to heat it anymore if the kids aren't in it. Maybe move somewhere where the more of a one level. I've got size 14 feet. One of my big fears is falling down steps later in life. Not necessarily because I'm old, but because I'm big feet and I lose the balance then. Whoa. So the housing market's in a state of limbo. So says so Muhammad El Aryan because he's got people who are in their homes who don't want to sell and go out and get a higher mortgage cost. And there's people who want to buy a home, but the higher mortgage costs are crimping their ability to what they can afford. So as L. Arian says eloquently, he goes, when you go from record low mortgage rates to levels that we haven't seen for 20 years, you've destroyed both demand and supply. That's the irony is that the supply has come down and demand has gone down as well. That is the way you destroy the housing market. We've got to be really careful because the housing market is central to our economy. So in history, he's already starting to tell you what we're going to write the chapter on, what the Fed broke by raising his rates as fast as they have or aggressively as they did. 525 basis points to tame inflation. This, he believes, will push the economy into a recession or a soft landing, um, but a slowing back half of 2023. He's been a loud critic of the Fed's monetary tightening over the past year. Previously, he has said the U.S. faced an uncomfortably high probability of a downturn. The central bank couldn't afford to cut interest rates prematurely. That could risk inflation expectations spiraling out of control. So I like him a lot. And again, I would never change my whole investment thesis based on one person. But when I tell you Dan Ives and Muhammad El Arian are people I, I read when they publish, I think it's a compliment. I, I don't think you need to be intimidated by that. So there's a lack of interest this on the last week of August. There's continued relative strength in the mega caps. Today, we're digesting the jolts, the job openings for July and consumer confidence for August. The SP 500 is nearing its 50 day moving average, 4460. And there's some reacting to the falling treasury yields in response to recent data. Now, that's the one that always is going to interest me because I don't sit, I don't think I've built a career on pounding this every single day. But if you've listened for the last 20, 25 years of this show, you know, I talk about the 10 year treasury a lot. And earlier in this segment, I talked about how much cash I have one. earning five and a half percent. And that's why I'm not going to take my mortgage that's charging me two and a half percent and swap them out for each other. Ten-year treasury was sitting at four and a quarter yesterday. Now it sits at four point one three. Okay, I like stocks when we're in that four to three and a half range. Of uh, stocks when we're in the three and a half to one and a half percent range. Four and a quarter. I'll be honest with you. With my age, I'm like, I don't need, I don't need my new money to be put to risk. I can wait. Um, if you have standards, it's always a good thing. Um, I've said before when I was a younger man, I would never date anyone five years younger than me because we just don't have anything in common. It was a standard. I want to have something in common with that person. You have to have standards to win on wall street. You can't be going loosey goosey and changing on the fly. You'd find me online at Rob Black show.com. That's Rob Black show. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archived podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth's certified financial planners online at robblackshow.com. Some interesting loose ends to wrap up. Americans love to get high. Listen to this statistics. Now, we know why Americans love to get high or what's fueled the ability to get high. Loosen laws around substances, changing public perception, 
and more Americans self-medicating for mental health reasons. 44% of young adults age 19 to 30. And 28% of adults age 35 to 50 reported using marijuana in the prior 12 months. That's a record high for each group. More than 11% of young adults said that they use cannabis on at least 20 of the prior 30 days. That's double from a decade ago. The number of American workers testing positive for marijuana hit a 25-year record high, according to an annual survey from Quest Diagnostics, which is the interesting part of the story. The only company making money in the world of cannabis seems to be the one testing whether or not we're high at work. There's been a lot of marijuana stocks that just aren't close to being right. Now, some of them are retooling and trying to be beverage companies as well and buying beer brands. But uh, I find that to be really, really interesting. Not like crazy, but... I like that story on some levels. If you're picking up what I'm putting down. Amazon's testing a $35 free shipping minimum for people who are not members of the company's prime loyalty program. Up until now, to you would have to be required to spend $25 to qualify for free shipping. Coffee beans have been shown to make concrete stronger. Instead of using sand, which is considered a natural resource, Australian scientists have Produce concrete that's 30% stronger by replacing 15% of the mixture sand with charred coffee grounds. I will say this. Some people are just genius. I think the worst part about coffee are the coffee grounds, right? What do you do with them? How do you not get them all over the kitchen? They seem to be problematic for me. But Australia has figured out a way how to make concrete stronger. I, I love that story. Instacart's going to be testing the IPO market. It needs to really focus on partnerships that it has. Otherwise, that's going to be a IPO that breaks. Gig economy companies have struggled as public companies because of their lack of profitability. It's the first big venture backed tech IPO since December of 2021. Stock will list on the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol CART, C-A-R-T. It's got 15% year-over-year revenue growth. I was reading the S filings yesterday, a net income of $114 million. PepsiCo is committed to buying $175 million of the company's stock in a private placement. That is always interesting to see who, uh, how companies spend venture capital money. So Twitter and X aren't profitable, right? But you know who is by a lot? OnlyFans. And I know of OnlyFans. I don't know a lot of OnlyFans. OnlyFans, I know, it has a lot of like sexy teachers who get into trouble for moonlighting and taking topless photos, and the school district finds out about it, and teachers get fired. I, I, I think that's the primary use of OnlyFans. I don't really know. I saw Dre DiMatteo. I think that's her name. She was in The Sopranos. How long ago was that? 30 years, 25 years ago? And she's 50 plus. And there was a headline yesterday that here she is with just a hat covering up all her body parts on her brand new OnlyFans page. And I think I read she was charging 50 bucks a month for a subscription and she's going to put up risque pictures. Not a lot of acting jobs these days, huh? So OnlyFans generated a profit of $525 million before taxes. The owners of the company paid themselves a dividend of $338 million. That's a pretty attractive business. And like I said, Twitter and X can't seem to make money. What do we have to hit on? Apple shares are down 10, almost 11% of the last month. Not great compared to the S&P 500. The S&P 500 was down 3% in that time. 4.8%, uh, I'm sorry. The Dow was down 3%. Analysts blame the nose dive on a few factors, including reduced demand for Apple products in the Chinese market. Who's going to want to get that $3,500 headset? And here's my opinion on, on Apple. 
long term hold, it's it's always going to be expensive. Should it be more than five percent of your portfolio? Probably not. Um, but I looked at and see, I just told you how the thirty five hundred dollar headsets being kind of laughed at, and sales in China are struggling because China's had the zero COVID policy and they really haven't found their their funk yet, their groove. They're still in the funk as consumers go. Where I go with this story is yesterday, I looked at the best-selling phones One. in the world. The iPhone 14 Pro Max, number one. The iPhone 14 Pro, number two. The highest end phone that Apple offers is number one and number two. Then you go down to the iPhone 14 is number three. And then you go down to the iPhone 13 is number four. That's pretty impressive. Um, short term, always going to be overpriced. Keep in mind, I own shares of Apple. Long term, eh, it'd be nice if they can come up with a growth catalyst other than that $3,500 headset. I think their next, not their, not this year's watch, but the following year's watch when it's 10 year anniversary, expect something big then. Maybe it does blood pressure. Maybe it does. Um, yeah blood readings sh- blood sugar readings so for diabetics you can find me online at Roblox Show Twitter Roblox Show YouTube Roblox Show I'm Rob Black. for more information about EP Wealth visit robblack.com that's robblack.com